So now I have the pleasure of introducing Marla Newman, who's the first vice chair of the National Low Income Housing Coalition's Board of Directors, to introduce our first panel. Marla? I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker. His name is Richard Rothstein. Richard is a research associate of the Economic Policy Institute and a fellow at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, as well as a fellow at the Haas Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. In addition to being the author of The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, this particular book that I think some of you may have seen out front when you were coming in, just wanted to make sure you made the connection. Richard is also the author of books focusing on education, including Grading Education, Getting Accountability Right, Class and Schools, Using Social, Economic, and Educational Reform to Close the Black-White Achievement Gap, and finally, The Way We Were, Myths and Realities of America's Student Achievement. So please join me as we welcome Richard Rothstein to the stage to present for us. Thank you very much. I appreciate your well being here this morning, and it's a delight to be working with you. Uh, as you all know, the, uh, this country made a resolution in the mid-20th century that racial segregation was wrong, that it was immoral, that it was harmful, that it was unconstitutional. And we abolished uh, segregation beginning in the 1930s, first in law schools. Uh, the Legal Defense Fund sued um, uh, law schools for segregation because they figured that if uh, judges were too stupid to understand anything else, they could understand you couldn't get a good legal education in a segregated law school. And then they went on to uh, challenge segregation in higher education and then in elementary and secondary schools. And then in, um, uh, in the 1960s, uh, after Brown, we abolished segregation and everything from uh, buses to uh, lunch counters, to public accommodations, to water fountains. Um, and yet, after all of these uh, civil rights victories, we have left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. Um, we all accept this as a natural part of our environment. We've made no efforts to do anything about it. There are no programs to do anything about it. Um, and uh, it's something that people who claim to be concerned about segregation think that this is outside the realm of our responsibility. And um, I think there is a, a reason for that. There are probably many reasons for that. But probably the most important reason is that when we abolish segregation in all of these other areas of American life, uh, if we abolish segregation, for example, in lunch counters, the next day you could sit at any lunch counter. If you abolish segregation in water fountains, the next day you can drink from any water fountain. But if we abolish segregation in neighborhoods, the next day things don't look much different. And because it's more difficult, a more difficult kind of segregation to address, we've come up with a rationalization, a, uh, a way of excusing ourselves from this responsibility. And that rationalization is a national myth which is that uh, government has had nothing to do with this segregation of neighborhoods. Unlike segregation in buses or water fountains or schools or lunch counters, uh, segregation in neighborhoods is not an unconstitutional act of government. It's something that sort of happened by accident. It happened because old oh, people like to live with each other of the same race. Or maybe uh, white homeowners didn't want to sell a home to an African American. Or maybe real estate agents, private real estate agents, steered families uh, uh, to same race neighborhoods. Or maybe African Americans just don't have the income to um, move to middle class communities. All of these individual, personal, 
decisions in which government wasn't involved is what created racial segregation, and that makes it different from the other forms of segregation, and it absolves us of responsibility for doing anything about it, because what happened by accident can only be undone by accident. And the Supreme Court has ratified this view. They call it, and you all know the term, they call it de facto segregation. The Supreme Court has said, and we've all come to believe, that if we have de facto segregation, segregation because of all of these individual decisions, if we have de facto segregation, there's really um, nothing we're permitted to do anything about, not much less can do anything about. It would be a violation of the Constitution, the Supreme Court said, to um, take aggressive measures or explicit measures to desegregate neighborhoods that weren't created by government. Only if you had something the Supreme Court says in a less familiar term, de jure segregation, only then are we not only permitted to do something about it, we're obligated to do something about it. Well, legal scholars, sophisticated legal scholars, generally think that this distinction between de facto and de jure segregation is nonsense. But I'm going to accept the distinction for the purpose of this discussion uh, this afternoon. Um, let's assume that there is a big difference between de facto and de jure segregation. De facto segregation is something we can't do anything about. De jure segregation is something we're obligated to remedy. The problem with the Supreme Court's view is not they're wrong with their theory, they may be. The problem is they're wrong in their facts. The residential segregation of every metropolitan area in this country was not created by accident, not created by private choices. It was created by explicit policies of the federal, state, and local governments, racially explicit policies designed to create racial boundaries everywhere, designed to ensure that African Americans and whites, and whites could not live near one another, and with power, uh, po policies that are so powerful that they determine the racial landscapes in our metropolitan areas today. We cannot begin to address this problem unless we recognize the factual error that was made. And that's why uh, I, I've written a book called The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. Because unless we learn this history, we're not going to have the intellectual and legal foundation for doing something about it, to create an integrated society. So in the few minutes I have this morning, or this afternoon, whatever it is, I guess it depends on your time zone. <laughs> in mine, it's still the morning. <laughs> um, in the few minutes I have, let me describe some of the major policies that uh, our government followed to create residential segregation. I'll begin by talking a bit about public housing. Now, we all think of public housing as a place where poor people live. Uh, mostly minorities, African Americans and now increasingly uh, Latinos. Uh, but public housing didn't begin as a place where poor people lived. Public housing began in this country as a program in the New Deal under the Roosevelt administration as um, homes for working class families who were not subsidized. The public housing projects uh, were uh, families who rented apartments there, paid the full cost of the housing in their rents. They were working class, middle class, lower middle class families. And the federal government, beginning in um, the, the New Deal in, when, in 1933, explicitly segregated public housing everywhere in the country. I'm not talking about the South. This is a northern phenomenon primarily, creating separate projects for African Americans and whites, in many cases segregating neighborhoods that hadn't previously known segregation, that were integrated. That may surprise you. You may be surprised to hear that in the uh, mid to early 20th century, there were many integrated neighborhoods in metropolitan areas. They had to be integrated because workers at that time didn't have automobiles to get to work. So if you had a downtown area, which was the center of employment in a metropolitan area, African Americans and Irish and Italian and Jewish, other immigrant workers and rural workers who came to work in the cities all had to live in broadly the same neighborhoods. And so they were integrated, even in the South. The South had Jim Crow and things like water fountains and restaurants and buses, but not in housing, because people had to live close enough to walk to work. The other reason that, they, um, uh, that we had integrated neighborhoods was that uh, the major form of intercity transportation at that time was the railroads. The railroads uh, were the, uh, the terminals, were the center of urban life. And the railroads would only hire African Americans as Pullman car porters and baggage handlers. So if you had a downtown railroad station, 
in the middle of a mostly white neighborhood, you had to have African Americans living there. So these were integrated as well. The great African American uh, novelist, uh, poet, playwright, uh, Langston Hughes, described in his autobiography, I, I assume some of you have read it, um, how he grew up in an integrated Cleveland neighborhood. He said his best friend in high school was Polish. He dated a Jewish girl. This was not uh, unique in early to mid 20th century America. But the Public Works Administration and the New Deal demolished housing in that neighborhood, in that Cleveland neighborhood, and built separate housing for African Americans and for whites, creating a pattern of segregation in that part of Cleveland that never had previously existed and never would have existed had not the federal government imposed it. And this, as I said, was done all over the country. In, in my book, The Color of Law, I like to talk about places like Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, Berkeley, California, because I figure if people uh, can understand that this was done in liberal areas like that, they'll understand how, what a national policy it was. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, the, the federal government abolished an area near uh, MIT, the Central Square neighborhood. Some of you may be familiar with it. It was an integrated neighborhood, about half black and half white in the 1930s, but the federal government built separate housing for whites and for African Americans, creating a pattern of segregation and helped to determine the future growth of racial boundaries in the Boston metropolitan area, making Boston one of the segregated, most segregated cities in the country. Um, during World War II, hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of defense production to take jobs in, in war industries. There had been no employment during the Depression, and uh, uh, the war industries were the first employment opportunities that many people had, both African Americans and whites flocked to these centers. We call the African American migration the second great migration during World War II. And the, the cities where these defense plants were located were growing in population so rapidly that the government had to provide housing for workers or else the, the defense production lines would have ground to a halt. The largest shipbuilding area, and this is another outside Berkeley, California, the largest shipbuilding area on the West Coast was in Richmond, California, where the Kaiser shipyards built uh, five shipyards that had nobody living there uh, at the beginning of the war, nobody working there at the beginning of the war, and by the end of the war there were 100,000 workers. Richmond was a tiny community of 20,000 people, all white, except for a few um, uh, families living on the outskirts who were related to Pullman car porters, in fact and working in the homes of white families in Richmond as domestics. The federal government built separate housing for white workers and for black workers who came to Richmond, an area that had never known segregation before there and had been no African Americans living there before to speak of. Separate housing for African Americans and for whites along the railroad tracks and in the industrial area. A temporary housing was built for the African American workers. Temporary because the city of Richmond announced that at the end of the war, African Americans would have to leave the city and more stable housing in the residential areas that whites occupied uh, because those were considered future permanent residents of, of Richmond. This again was done everywhere in the country. Following World War II, uh, you had an enormous housing shortage. Not only uh, had there been no housing built during the Depression, uh, but uh, during World War II, it was prohibited, actually, to use uh, construction materials for civilian purposes, except for housing for war workers. So there was a big backlog of housing then. And uh, we had millions of returning war veterans coming home and needing housing. They were living doubled up with relatives uh, in Quonset huts, uh, uh, and uh, they needed housing. So President Truman, who succeeded Roosevelt in 1949, <laughs> proposed a National Housing Act to vastly expand the supply of public housing. And remember, we're still talking about housing for working families, not poor people. Um, he proposed this program, and um, opponents of the public housing program, who were conservative Republicans, decided that they had to defeat Truman's proposal for an expansion of the public housing program. They didn't want to defeat it for racial reasons. Remember, it was all segregated. They didn't want to defeat it because they didn't like poor people. This housing wasn't for poor people. It was for working families. They wanted to defeat it because they believed that public housing was socialistic and the government shouldn't be involved in housing and uh, the private market should take care of it, even though the private market wasn't taking care of it. And so they came up with a strategy which we call a poison pill strategy. 
And their poison pill strategy went as follows. They would propose an amendment to the National Housing Act that could be passed. But when, then with this amendment, when the entire Housing Act came before Congress, the amendment itself would make the bill unpalatable and it would go down to defeat. That's a poison pill strategy. And what do you think the amendment that the conservatives in Congress proposed was? They proposed, uh, led by uh, you, some of you, I see there's some people almost my age in the audience. You'll remember uh, Senator Robert Taft of um, uh, Ohio, the leading Republican in the Senate, proposed an amendment to the National Housing Act saying that from now on there could be no more racial discrimination in the public housing program. We had to have integrated programs. And they proposed this amendment because they assumed that northern liberal Democrats would join with them and that would create a majority. The amendment would be attached to the National Housing Act. And then when the full National Housing Act came up before the Senate and the House, the conservatives would flip and vote against it. They would be joined by Southern Democrats who were all in favor of public housing if it was segregated, but not if it was integrated, and the bill would go down to defeat. So Northern liberals campaigned against the integration amendment in 1949 in order to save public housing. The campaign against the integration amendment was led by the leading civil rights advocate in the United States Senate, Hubert Humphrey. Some of you will remember that name. And they succeeded. The integration amendment went down to defeat. The Full Housing Act came up now before the Senate and the House as a continued segregated program, and it was passed. That was 1949, not so long ago, if you ask me. And for the next 15 years, the federal government used that vote, the defeat of the Integration Amendment, as its excuse for segregating not only public housing, but all housing programs that the federal government ran. Well, under that 1949 Housing Act, the, the large public housing programs that you're familiar with uh, that came to be um, iconic and symbolic of public housing, places like the Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago or Pruitt Igo in St. Louis, so you, you, you remember that one. It was actually two separate projects. It wasn't Pruitt Igo. The Pruitt project was for um, African Americans. The Igo project was for whites. Two separate projects built under the 1949 Housing Act. Very soon after this project and many others across the country were built, a development occurred everywhere, which was quite surprising and uniform. The projects were, which had been designated for whites, and this was an open, explicit designation. It's not that African Americans happened to apply to the Pruitt Project and whites happened to apply to the Igo Project because they liked to live with other people of the same race. These were explicit designations on the projects. And this development occurred all across the country where there were large numbers of vacancies in the white designated projects, like IGO, and long waiting lists in the black des designated projects, like Pruitt. This happened everywhere. Eventually, uh, the situation became so conspicuous, it was untenable, you couldn't have long waiting lists for one project and just down the street, large numbers of vacancies in another. All the projects were opened up to African Americans. At about the same time, industry left the cities. We know that they no longer needed to um, be located near railroad terminals or deep water ports because we now had highways. So industries left cities and moved to rural and suburban areas where they could have extended single, um, single floor assembly lines. Fewer and fewer good jobs were available in the cities where these now all African American projects were located. People in those projects became poorer and poorer. Eventually the projects came to be subsidized once they came to be subsidized because the residents could no longer pay rent because they didn't have good jobs, investment in the projects declined, maintenance in the project declined, and they became the kind of vertical slums that we um, became familiar with as, as representing public housing. But that's not how the program began. Well, the question that uh, should arise in your minds and that certainly arose in mine as I was doing this research is why all these vacancies in the white designated projects? and not in the black designated projects. And that was because of another federal program, it turns out, that was even more powerful in segregating the nation than the public housing program. And that was a program by another federal New Deal agency, the Federal Housing Administration, that subsidized the construction of giant suburbs everywhere in the country. Before the FHA came along, if you were to build a single family home in the suburbs, 
um, you'd buy some land and get a contractor to build it, or maybe there was a builder who was really a risk taker and would build five or six homes in one place. But nobody could build, as for example, in Levittown, the most famous one of these, uh, east of New York City, 17,000 homes of which he had no buyers, which the builder had no buyers. The Federal Housing Administration subsidized builders like Levitt um, to build these giant subdivisions. It was everywhere in the country. Uh, Los Angeles became the symbol of uh, suburbanization in the 1950s. Uh, suburbs like Lakewood or Panorama City or Westchester in Los Angeles, all FHA subsidized. Uh, some of you uh, may remember Pete Seeger used to sing a song written by Malvina Reynolds about uh, uh, houses made of ticky-tacky uh, on the hillside. They all look the same. That was a, about a giant subdivision south of San Francisco in, called Westlake. Well, how could they build these giant subdivisions? Levitt, as I say, could never have assembled the capital to build a, a suburb of 17,000 homes. The only way he could do so was by going to the Federal Housing Administration, submitting his plans for the development, including the architectural design of the homes, the materials he's going to use, the setback from the streets, the layout of the streets, and a commitment never sell, to sell a home to an African American that was required by the FH to provide this financing. The FHA even required Levitt and the other builders of the, these subdivisions I described um, to include a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. This was not a hidden history. This was an open history that I'm talking about. Everybody who moved into Levittown or Westlake or Lakewood or Westchester or Panorama City or any of these other developments knew that they were prohibited from renting or selling a home to an African American. It was in their deeds. As a result, whites left public housing and private housing in urban areas and moved to these suburbs. The subsidy was so enormous that a white working class family could leave public housing, like the IGO projects, move to an FHA or VA mortgaged home in a suburb like Levittown or the others I mentioned, and pay less in, in their monthly housing costs than they were paying for rent in public housing. That's how enormous the subsidy was. Well, this happened everywhere in the country. Um, we suburbanized the country in this way. African Americans were prohibited from participating in this suburbanization. They mostly continued to rent homes, either in the private market in urban areas or in public housing. And what's the result? Well, today, those homes that sold at that time very inexpensive homes, Levittown, for example, cost homes then cost, they were small homes, 750 square feet. They cost maybe $8,000, $9,000. In today's money, that's $100,000, roughly speaking. Into the adjusted for inflation. Today, those homes sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. The white families who were subsidized to move into these homes gained over the next couple of generations equity in their homes, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 in wealth. Most middle class families in this country gain what wealth they have from the equity they have in their homes. The white families used this appreciation in their homes, this accumulating wealth, to send their children to college. They used it to take care of emergencies, whether medical or, or economic emergencies. You know, if you lose a job and you have wealth, you can weather the storm. If you don't have wealth, you can't. African American families who were renting and gaining none of this wealth could do none of that. As a result, today, nationwide, on average, African American incomes are about 60, 60 percent of white incomes. And you'd think that people with the same income save at the same rates. The wealth ratio should be about the same. But in fact, while African American incomes are 60 percent of white incomes, African American wealth is 10 percent of white wealth on average. And that enormous disparity between a 60 percent income ratio and a 10 percent wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid-20th century, that we have pretended to ourselves didn't exist, and that we have never remedied or attempted to remedy. It, this wealth gap underlies much of the inequality in this country today, not only in housing, 
Uh, the wealth gap concentrates African Americans in lower income communities in urban areas where the violence, as we've seen in Ferguson and uh, Milwaukee and uh, St. Paul and other communities, uh, uh, continues to flare up occasionally. The wealth gap and the segregation of, of the races uh, in metropolitan areas that was created by this federal policy underlies uh, the achievement gap in schools that results from uh, attendance at segregated schools where the children with social and economic disadvantages are concentrated, uh, leaving the schools with very little ability to uh, produce the kinds of outcomes that they can produce when children come to school in good health and well-rested and well-nourished and um, with, with access to high-quality early childhood programs and, and so forth. So most of the problems in this country, the most serious social problems in this country, owe themselves, at least in part, to the creation of segregation by the federal government. There were many, many other policies created by federal, state, and local governments uh, in the course of the 20th century that segregated our communities, and many policies that you're involved with today that perpetuate it no longer has to be intentional. Once we establish these segregated structures, policies that aren't explicitly ra uh, racial can perpetuate or even exacerbate racial segregation. So for example, uh, the Section 8 program, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, with which you're all familiar, perpetuates, it reinforces racial segregation. A family with a Section 8 voucher, a low-income family with a Section 8 voucher, is more likely to live in a low-income segregated neighborhood than a family with an equally low income who does not live in such a segregated neighborhood. And the reason you're all familiar with is, is uh, obvious. It's because most jurisdictions permit landlords to refuse to accept families with Section 8 vouchers, and so families and uh, landlords in middle-class communities refuse them, and only landlords in segregated communities accept them for the most part. It's because we haven't adjusted uh, the, um, the rents, the small area and run program that uh, was proposed by the Obama administration and then stopped by the Trump administration and now hopefully reinstituted as a result of court action uh, by the Legal Defense Fund and other civil rights groups. Um, the rents, the average subsidy given to Section 8 families is based on an average in the public housing authority's jurisdiction. And it's a logical conclusion, uh, you all know this, that the, the average rent is too low to rent in a middle class high opportunity community. It's actually too high to rent in a segregated low income community and landlords, as I assume you know, typically exploit the program by charging more in segregated neighborhoods than the market would actually require. And the other thing is that uh, generally the, the Section 8 program is administered by a local housing authority whose jurisdiction is narrow rather than on a county-wide basis. And so um, it, it only uh, permits the use of vouchers within its jurisdiction, which is typically a lower income community than the high income communities, the higher income communities, higher opportunity communities in metropolitan areas. The low income housing tax credit perpetuates segregation in the same way. Uh, most low income housing tax credit programs are placed in already segregated low income communities reinforcing segregation. Landlords with uh, land developers would obviously rather use their tax credits to develop homes in already segregated neighborhoods because they don't have to hold 25 meetings to, of community opposition and explain what they're about to do. Uh, they don't, um, uh, land is cheaper in those neighborhoods typically. Um, they, can, uh, they don't have to advertise widely to rent vacant apartments. They can just put up a sign in the window and people who are eligible can um, see a vacant apartment. But we could very easily reform that program to place a priority on the development and the use of low income tax credits for high opportunity communities. Without doing that, we're reinforcing, perpetuating, and even exacerbating racial segregation. Well, so long as we believe that um, racial segregation was created by accident, we can only expect that it can be uncreated by accident. And that's not going to happen. But the power of this history, of knowing this history, is that if we understand that it was created by government, then it can be undone by government. 
Uh, Secretary of uh, Housing and Urban Development, Ben Carson, says that promoting integration is a form of social engineering and should be, uh, well, he doesn't know this history. What he doesn't realize is that racial integration is a form of undoing social engineering, not creating social engineering. Well, I know you're all uh, housing experts uh, involved in the low-income housing um, uh, industry, but you're also citizens. And I want to suggest something as citizens that you can do immediately about this. In the course of doing the research for this book, and as I say, I've only touched on a couple of the policies that the uh, federal, state, and local governments uh, implemented. There were many, many others. But in the course of doing the research for this book, because my background is as a scholar of education, I wanted to look at all the textbooks that are commonly used in American history classes in this country to teach this history. And I found that they all lie about it. Um, they, you know, I, it's, it's, a, it's the truth. Uh, they, I looked at the most commonly used American history textbook in this country, I don't know, today, it was two or three years ago when I uh, was doing this, this research, something called The Americans. Some of you may have children in high school who are still using that textbook. Um, but it's, it's typical of um, many textbooks, or all the textbooks, really, that I looked at. It has one paragraph devoted to um, what it calls the subhead is discrimination in the North. Within that paragraph, there's one sentence devoted to housing, and the sentence reads as follows. In the North, African Americans found themselves forced into segregated neighborhoods. That's it. You know, they woke up one day and they looked out the window and they said, hey, look, we're in a segregated neighborhood. <laughs> That's what we're teaching our young people. It's a crime. Because if our young people don't learn this history any better than we've learned it, they will be in as poor a position to remedy it as we've been. So one of the first things, <laughs> one of the first things that every one of us as citizens can do is look at the way our local schools, whether we have children there or nieces and nephews or grandchildren, um, look at the way our local schools are teaching this history and demand of the principals and superintendents and teachers and school board members with whom we have contact, demand that they correct this so that we do teach the history accurately so that we can do understand that racial segregation of neighborhoods is just as unconstitutional as separating people in water fountains. It requires a remedy that's just as demanding as the segregations we dealt with in the 20th century, and we can begin to undertake the task of desegregating America. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So the next segment of this is where we actually bring up our panelists and we're going to have a conversation. So the first panelist I'd like to invite up, I will introduce to you, is James A. Cadigan. James is director of the Third Good Marshall Institute of the uh, NAACP uh, Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Um, the James is, I'm sorry, let me say that again. James is director of the Thurgood Marshall Institute, the new research and advocacy center at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. James leads a team of lawyers, researchers, organizers, and archivists in helping to carry out LDF's racial justice mission. Prior to joining the Legal Defense Fund and the Thurgood Marshall Institute, James spent eight years in the Obama administration primarily at the U.S. Department of Justice, where he first served as Senior Counselor and Director of Policy Planning in DOJ's Civil Rights Division, and later as Counselor to Attorney General Loretta Lynch. James received his AB from Princeton University and JD, or his law degree, from Columbia Law School. Please join me and welcome James Cadigan. Our next panelist is Don Chen. Don leads the Just Cities and Regions team at the Ford Foundation, supporting urban development strategies to reduce poverty, 
expand economic opportunities, and advance sustainability in cities and regions in the U.S. and developing countries with a focus on shaping the delivery systems for affordable housing, community improvement, infrastructure, and city and regional planning. Don joined the Ford Foundation in 2008 as a program officer and assumed the role of director in 2015. Previously, he was the founder and CEO of Smart Growth America. He has authored many articles on land use, transportation, social equity, and environmental policy. Please join me as we welcome Don Chen. So I'd like to introduce to you Lisa Rice. Lisa is also with the National Fair Housing Alliance where she serves as Executive Vice President. In her capacity, uh, she oversees resource development, public policy, communication and enforcement divisions of the agency and helps to lead the agency's efforts to expand equal access to quality and sustainable credit. She is responsible for helping to achieve the organization's goals of addressing the crisis of segregation in America and the ultimate objective of achieving equal housing opportunities for all Americans. Please join me as we welcome Lisa Rice to the stage. Okay, so we've heard some very riveting comments uh, by Richard. Uh, before we actually get started with our conversation, I'd like to uh, ask each of you, and I'll start with James and work our way down, to share a little bit about the work you do and why this is important to you having this conversation today. Thanks very much. Uh, so I'm the director of the Federal Marshall Institute, which is LDF's new research and advocacy arm. Uh, we carry out LDS racial justice mission in concert and in parallel with our traditional litigation strengths. And we're incredibly proud that Richard is a senior fellow of the Thurgood Marshall Institute and so have been incredibly pleased by the response to color of law and the fact that it's raised to a new level of the public consciousness the importance of this conversation about housing discrimination, about desegregation, about the pernicious effects of public policy that has impacted our residences and residential neighborhoods over the past 50 and 100 years. For uh, the purposes of this conversation, even though I'm no longer a litigator, I think it'd be most helpful to go over a couple of the cases that LDF has litigated most recently uh, as a way of giving an introduction to some of our work. And I'm sure many of the folks in the room are very familiar with that work and we have many partners in that work in each of those cases. First and foremost, uh, Thompson v. Hud, as you all know, the 1995 case that took some 20 years to resolve is a case that we joined with the ACLU of Maryland in challenging discrimination by HUD in the provision of public housing. The fact that it took 20 years to resolve is not surprising because litigation takes a long time, but the precedent that was set in the remedy phase of that litigation, the uh, imprimatur of the court in saying that it is incredibly important that local jurisdictions and that HUD take care to be deliberate in the provision of vouchers to be affirmative in the way that they promote and protect access to affordable housing that they have an ob obligation under the Fair Housing Act, the affirmatively further obligation, as many of you know, to make sure that housing is provided in a non-discriminatory and constitutional fashion is incredibly important and one of the cases that we are most proud of. In addition, we have uh, a newer case that has come up recently in Michigan, actually two in Michigan, uh, first in challenging uh, property tax assessment liens that have been levied discriminatorily against African American populations in Wayne County. We have sued in a class action to try to remedy that and make sure that uh, those who live in low income communities and black families are able to have their taxes be assessed fairly, that liens aren't imposed on based on unfair assessments of the value of housing, particularly in the wake of the housing crisis of 2008, 2009, and make sure that Wayne County doesn't take advantage of its own residents. We are in active litigation on jurisdictional, jurisdictional grounds there to proceeding with the case, and we look forward to a resolution at some point in the future, and we will continue to litigate day in and day out to make sure that residents are provided and afforded their constitutional rights. 
Also in Michigan, we have the case of water tax liens in Flint, Michigan, and the fact that where residents have not had clean water for up to three years, they are not being punished for not paying their tax bill, and that punishment be compounded by liens being assessed, sold off, and the debt ballooning, leading to foreclosures. The foreclosure rates are 10 to 15 times foreclosure rates for uh, white families in comparable parts of the state, and that is clearly discriminatory and unconstitutional, and so we are advocating against that too. And then the most recent victory Richard just alluded to was in beating back uh, this HUD department's attempts to roll back the small area fair market rule and make sure that there is rebalancing in the way that HUD apportions its monies for Section 8 vouchers. But the idea that this rule would be promulgated uh, through the appropriate APA process by the Obama administration and then summarily rolled back by the Trump administration is ludicrous. And so we challenged that and won in court, and we are very pleased to have gotten that rule. <laughs> And I wish I could take credit for that, but like I said, I'm no longer a litigator. Our fantastic litigators at LDF were all responsible for that work. Uh, at TMI, at LDF, we are, are very proud to be supporting that work and doing the social science research that tel helps back up these arguments that we need to make clearly and loudly, just as Richard's book does. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm Don Chen with the Ford Foundation. It is a real honor to be here at this forum. Uh, also, to be a great honor to be on the stage with uh, everyone here. Um, Ford Foundation has been active on affordable housing issues since the early 1960s. Um, most of uh, the world is familiar with our work in community development uh, and our, our subsequent work on asset building, uh, primarily home ownership. Um, but, um, uh, a lesser known part of our history was our involvement in fair housing uh, and rental affordable housing going back even earlier. Uh, and um, if you all are familiar with the history, you know that we funded um, NAACP, the Urban League, um, uh, the, the National Committee. Um, there we go. The National Committee Against Housing and Dis yeah. Discrimination in Housing, or so. That's, uh, uh, which was a think tank, you know. And so uh, speaking to Richard's. Um, you know, points about uh, really understanding the research, the history, uh, and having our case uh, be very solid when we make the case for uh, these reforms. Uh, that, that's a, a long-standing uh, body of work at the Ford Foundation. Um, over the last couple of decades, as many of you know, we have focused on home ownership as a primary focus on asset building. But in recent years, um, in the last few years, uh, we've come to realize uh, with stark clarity uh, the, the real emergency, the real crisis that we face in the United States uh, in terms of rental affordable housing and uh, the, the range of issues that really exacerbate that set of trends. Uh, the lack of affordable housing stock, uh, also the harassment that a lot of our tenants face, uh, the changes that we see in cities in terms of urban development proceeding at a pace uh, where uh, neighborhoods and uh, individuals, families can't keep up uh, with rising costs, and so that has caused us to pivot our strategy uh, to focus on uh, this set of issues, much more focused on rental housing, uh, fair housing, fighting evictions, fighting displacement, uh, and that's been a focus for us under our new strategy. Uh, the thing that I, I um, whenever I hear Richard, whenever I read uh, what he's uh, uh, writing about, uh, it always makes me incredibly angry uh, gets me fired up in, in lots of different ways. Um, it also, uh, as, as Richard, you and I have discussed, uh, it leads me, and I'm sure it'll lead you, to all these questions about what we do next. And so one really solid thing that we've discussed is the need to understand our history, as you've said. Um, and the thing that I want to raise is this notion that, you know, if you think fake news is bad, fake history is also a target. And I don't... people don't know their history, it's very easy to erase it or to retell it in a way that's convenient to whatever you're trying to, to get. And so it's, it's terribly important for us to do that. It's also important for us to do what Diane was uh, imploring us to do, which is focus on the movement. Where is the power in this country to make change? It's not, I mean, there's a lot of power, of course, all the way at the level of the elites. Uh, here in Washington, they have unprecedented power. 
Um, but there is a remedy to that, and that is to build the base uh, to organize, to focus on advocacy and organizing, uh, as you, you said so eloquently, eloquently earlier, and all of you do in your neighborhoods and communities. This is something that we really have to prioritize as a nation. Uh, I am very happy to be uh, a part of a couple of different philanthropic collaboratives that also recognize this. There's the Amplify Fund, uh, which is housed at the Neighborhood Funders Group, uh, that some of my colleagues have been really pioneering in leading the formation of, and that's collaboration with a lot of funders like the Cerdna Foundation, Ford, of course, a variety of others, OSF, uh, and that is a, an effort to try to make sure that people in neighborhoods and communities have a voice in the development decisions that are facing their neighborhoods, and that is absolutely critical to what we're dealing with here. Uh, a second one is Funders for Housing and Opportunity. I see uh, Jeannie over here raise your hand, and Susan Thomas was here earlier too, right there, um, who are from FHO. Uh, and uh, that is an effort among national funders to really try to develop a center of gravity and also to focus on uh, affordable housing in communities and uh, movement building and, and uh, advocacy. And so this is, it's, there's a confluence that I see uh, that is really um, unprecedented as long as I've been in this field. Uh, of co cooperation, recognition of a common threat that we all have to grapple with. Uh, and I'm hoping that it'll begin to pay dividends. Um, now, I'm gonna end by saying that none of this will be easy. It's not gonna be a short-term thing. It's not like we're all asking just to put it back where it was. Uh, because frankly, our housing policies in the United States never served a huge swath of people, very lowest income, people of color, especially African Americans, and it is uh, absolutely irresponsible for us to even think that, you know, going back to the, you know, the last Democratic administration or any other administration that was pretty good on housing policy would solve all the problems that, that, uh, that go back many decades according to what Richard has written. Um, and so I think we need to start uh, the long game here. Uh, we need to change the narratives uh, that have been developed in our minds, you know, sh shared through popular culture, spread through all kinds of pundits and all kinds of different ways um, to vilify public housing, to vilify people who live in subsidized housing. Uh, the, all of the racial narratives that we see dominant in uh, our culture today are really working against us and we need to start to address those uh, today together. And so I'm looking forward to working with all of you and uh, trying to develop solutions uh, for this long journey that we are gonna win. Could you cue up the Housing Matters slide, please? And I'd like to just piggyback up um, on all of the comments that my colleagues here have said offer you a graphic to kind of illustrate, um, I think very poignantly, some of the things that Richard was talking about. Um, but it also describes, and I think will illustrate for you, the work that the National Fair Housing Alliance does and what we focus on. Uh, I think the name of the slide is Housing Matters. Is that? Oh, it is? Oh, okay, great. Um, and so what this slide illustrates is um, the impacts of what Richard was talking about. I, I don't have to tell anyone in this room that the United States did not start out being a hyper-segregated society. We became segregated because of many of the de jure and de facto policies that were implemented that Richard so el eloquently talks about. Uh, in his novel and here today. But what I wanna do is sort of illustrate for you um, the systemic issues, very complex, deeply rooted uh, systemic issues that we're working to address to undo a lot of the harm and, and the relics of these discriminatory policies that have been implemented uh, down through the years. Where you live in the United States, where you live matters. And where you live impacts literally everything about you, all of your life outcomes. If you give me your address, all I need is your address, I can predict whether or not your children will graduate from high school, whether or not they will go to college. If you give me your address, I can predict the chances of your children being incarcerated. 
I can predict the chances of you having certain diseases. I can tell you how long you're going to live if you give me your address. And that is because where you live in the United States, because of the policies that Richard has talked about, where you live is linked. It's inextricably linked to opportunity in the United States. So what I've done with this slide is try to illustrate that for you. Education. Education. Across the nation, we spend $340 more, dollars more on white students than we do students of color. Healthy environments. People of color are more likely to live in a neighborhood, a community, where there are hazardous environmental impacts. Uh, people of color are twice as likely to live in areas without potable water or proper sanitation. More than half of the people who live within two miles of a waste facility in the United States are people of color. When it comes to living wage jobs, people of color are less likely to live in neighborhoods that have the kinds of businesses that offer living wage jobs. When you think about health care, when you think about access to quality foods, people of color are more likely to live in what we call food deserts or health deserts. Uh, as one professor put it, in the United States, your zip code is more important than your genetic code when it comes to your health. And one issue that I've been devoting a lot more of my time and energy to is credit access. In the United States, we have a dual credit market. We have a safe, regulated credit market that represents the financial mainstream. And then we have an unsafe, very abusive, predatory, uh, unregulated market, right? The financial uh, underside or the subprime lending sector. Throughout the entire history of the United States, it's that unregulated, unsafe financial sector that has been the primary provider of credit to people of color. That is why, on average, on average, for African Americans and Latinos, on average, their credit score is 100 points lower than the credit score of our white brothers and sisters. And, and in today's environment, what that means, it has a whole lot of ramifications in terms of whether or not you're going to be able to get a loan to buy a house and whether or not you're going to be able to get a loan to purchase a car and how much you will ultimately pay for that financial instrument. So all of those things are things that we're working on and, and one of the things that we're really trying to do is to develop policies, practices, and opportunities to help transport people from that financial underside, from the non-traditional credit markets, over into the financial mainstream. This is, ex this is critically important because, you know, I think it was Prosperity Now who last year or the year before did a study that said it is going to take Latinos. So if white wealth were to stay constant, white wealth doesn't grow at all. It stays fixed where it is right now. It will take our Latino brothers and sisters 85 years to reach parity with our white brothers and sisters. African Americans, 228 years <coughs> to reach parity. If we keep going the way that we're going, those numbers are going to actually get worse. So we have to work today to dismantle the policies and the practices, the apparatus, the systems that have perpetuated segregation and perpetuated the wealth divide. And I'll stop. Thank you. So I'd like to, to start off with a question, actually, that came to me uh, in reading Richard's book. And in the book, uh, and Richard, you might want to start by uh, elaborating a little bit, and then I'd like each of you to, to share your thoughts on this. But uh, 
Richard, you mentioned something about we shouldn't have expected much from a Fair Housing Act that allowed African Americans to settle in a white suburb. Can you, can you elaborate on that a little more? Because I kind of want to get a sense of what your thoughts were, and certainly I'd like to get you all's reaction to that. Sure, I think I meant two things by that. One is the primary uh, focus of the Fair Housing Act is to prohibit future discrimination. And, well, it wasn't enforced for 20 years. There were no enforcement mechanisms really added to it for the first 20 years. But even if, since 1988, we had vigorously enforced the Fair Housing Act, and as you all know, there's lots of room for improvement there, it couldn't undo the segregation that had already been created. So. Let me go back to the example I used when I talked, uh, Levittown, for example. Uh, Levittown, as a result of the Fair Housing Act, now has some African Americans living in it, 2%. Um, in an area, a broader area, which has about a 15% African American population. So the Fair Housing Act was able to take care of that 2%, but because of the enormous wealth gap that I described that the private prior policies uh, created, um, it couldn't address the, the balance. And so Levittown is still not an entirely segregated community, but it's mostly segregated. It's mostly still a, a white neighborhood, and that's true of many of these suburbs around the country. The other thing I meant by it is that um, there is a provision in the Fair Housing Act, as you all know, that says that HUD has to uh, pursue policies that affirmatively further the purposes of the act. And uh, we've lately come to liberally uh, interpret that language as meaning affirmatively further integration. But there was no political support ever for that. And until we develop the political support through the kind of education that I was talking about, there's not going to be a possibility of, of substantial progress in implementing that law. Uh, can I take a minute to describe another historical of uh, things some, some of you may be interested in. In 1968, Richard Nixon was elected president. And he appointed as his Secretary of Housing and Urban Development a fellow named George Romney, the father of the recent presidential candidate. And this history I described was well known to him and is well known to most people in those days. As I say, it wasn't a hidden history, it's a forgotten history. George Romney announced that the federal government has created a white noose around um, uh, African-American neighborhoods in urban areas. And it was the federal government's responsibility, George Romney said, to untie that noose. And so he implemented a program called Open Communities, in which he proposed to withhold federal funds from any suburb that didn't desegregate, that didn't repeal an inclusionary zoning ordinance that prohibited the construction of townhouses or apartments, that didn't admit public housing units, and that um, uh, didn't admit subsidized housing programs. And there was no political support for this, or very little political support for this program. Uh, he actually did withhold funds from three segregated suburban areas, Baltimore County being one, a war in Michigan being another, and an area near Cleveland being another. And there was a big uproar about it, and President Nixon reined him in, canceled the Open Communities Project, and um, uh, uh, eventually forced him out as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and we've had nothing so aggressive since. George Romney used this as authority for the Open Communities Program, the affirmatively furthering the purposes of this act language. But you can't just simply implement the language without developing the political support for it. And we don't today have that political support. So our mission, it seems to me, the uh, Fair Housing Community's mission, is to develop the political support as a precondition for implementing the kinds of programs that George Romney tried to implement and that we should implement today. I guess I have a couple of reflections on that. First, I think we just need a, a radical rethinking of how we approach public policy because the same way that we have, uh, even if we were to take some of the remedial actions that Richard suggests in his book, it would take not just the political support, but time. An incredibly long time, simply because of the entrenched nature of the problem that we now face, the problem of our governments and our own creation. We see the same thing in education. Brown v. Board, we litigated in 1954. We still have multiple jurisdictions throughout the country that are under desegregation orders that have not complied with the essential uh, holding of that case. 
And if it takes some 60 years to comply with the very basic notion that everybody should have equal access to education regardless of the color of your skin, then when it comes to something that's substantially more complex, like desegregating housing, where people live, where people go to work, where they go to school, that just requires a radical rethinking of how we do public policy because litigation at the end of the day, as much as it is our bread and butter at LDF, and that's the critical tool that we provide in the fight, that comes so far after the, the genesis of the problem that without upfront thinking about our investments, upfront thinking about the laws and regulations that we create and the infrastructure we put in place to push forward our agenda of a more fair, more open, and more just society, then we will be lost and we'll always be at the back end fighting for crumbs as opposed to creating the kind of infrastructure that will support our notion of an ideal American society. So without that kind of rethinking, and I think we, we really have to take this opportunity and an opportunity provided by the publication of Richard's book and the fact that it has gotten so much attention to think about what is the goal 30, 40, 50 years from now and how do we get there as opposed to just trying to remedy what we know we're suffering from right now. Where do we want to be in the next half century? Where do we want to be in the next 100 years? Um, it's a great question. And um, I think what uh, many of us lack in the fields that we work in is that vision. The vision for how things could be better in our country, in our communities, and really put it out there so we can see all of the different pieces of what we do feeding into that vision. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great vision. It's kind of the opposite of what you were describing, Lisa, the, you know, where uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't have housing opportunity, all of these cascading misfortunes can affect you and your family and your community. But if you have a positive vision for how we achieve uh, stable housing, um, neighborhood stability, all those things, then suddenly people can gain traction in their lives. And, and um, you know, enjoy the prosperity that we're all supposed to be able to enjoy. And so I think that's really critical. Um, and you know, underneath that, uh, of course, as you say, James, um, litigation is really critical. Um, you know, the, the, so many of the, the things that we've been describing here on, on the stage and that we deal with every day uh, are critical capacities that we need to weave together. Um, when I read that passage in Richard's book, it led me to um, think about the, the infighting that we have in our field. You know, you might have folks who might criticize, hey, you know, the, the Fair Housing Act doesn't go far enough, which is totally legit, uh, because it doesn't. Um, and then there, there are folks who will argue all different sides uh, of these issues, whether it's home ownership versus rental, or fair housing versus, you know, investing in communities that already have a lot of affordable housing. Um, I, I understand why we, we engage in all these fights. Frankly, the Ford Foundation was, was a, a player in, that, uh, in, in those debates as well. But I would say now we're under such stress. We have such an enormous crisis. Uh, and it's not just this, this administration. It's been many years in the making. We need to all come together within the field, figure out how we can develop that vision, get behind it, and really push it forward. So um, that's, that's something that we're very focused on trying to, to bring those uh, different factions within the housing field together uh, towards the common goal. One of the things that we're lacking is a cohesive policy, uh, housing policy uh, for the nation. The Fair Housing Act, when I read that passage in, in Richard's book, the thing that struck me is that the Fair Housing Act does include um, a portion of that federal policy. The Fair Housing Act says that it shall be the national policy of the United States of America to provide for fair housing and equal opportunity for everyone throughout the country. And we have never done that, right? And we've never had a HUD who has the responsibility and enforcement, uh, the, uh, the responsibility, excuse me, and authority for enforcing the Fair Housing Act. We've never had uh, a HUD, arguably, except for George Romney, that established a national fair housing policy for the nation. And as a result, we have had a HUD that down through the years has actually engaged in housing discrimination themselves and perpetuated, in some instances, created segregation, but perpetuated segregation and engaged in other kinds of policies and practices that 
that directly I uh, violated the Fair Housing Act or indirectly violated the Fair Housing Act. I think after Katrina, where HUD had the responsibility of implementing hundreds of millions of dollars of disaster relief throughout the state of Louisiana and other states, and it did so in a discriminatory fashion. Even after fair housing advocates brought it to HUD's attention, HUD did not take direct corrective action to, um, to reverse its actions, and we had to sue HUD to make them do the right thing. I, and so I think that part of the, the challenge has been that lack of education. I, I know I've been spending my days, and I know your leader, Diane, has been spending her days too, trying to educate people at HUD and in the new administration about fair housing policies so that they don't make critical mistakes that will harm uh, consumers, but also in helping to guide them uh, to do the right thing so that we can expand equal housing opportunities. And one of the things that I'm struck by every time I meet with someone in the administration is this common refrain, we don't know what to do. Right, and without a vision, the people perish, right? Uh, and so I think that what we can do is help to create that vision and push that vision. You know, it's, it's, it's a groundswell, it has to be, but create that vision, get on the same page, stop the infighting, and then, and then push that vision forward. Thank you. But, but to that point. Because we talk about this comprehensive policy and, and having that vision and, and even cultivating that political will. So we have people here from all different parts of the country. How do we actually start that process? Because I know when, when people pack their bags to go home in a couple of days, what is that, that key thing that activates people when they get back home to start this whole process? And, and anybody can jump in first and we'll just take turns. Well, you know, things like what we're doing right now are profoundly important. Um, we're engaging with one another, we're communicating with one another, and we're not doing it under, you know, some sort of official apparatus, right? We're just getting together. And we need more of that. Now, there are some official apparatuses that are in place. The Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing process is one such thing, right? Um, unfortunately, HUD effectively suspended the AFFH rule. But that, that's a great opportunity to bring people together, different coalitions together, and um, to work toward a common goal. But I also have to tell you that at the federal level, at the national level, we're doing that more and more, and we've been forced to do it. We've been actually doing it, right, Diane, since um, the foreclosure crisis. At the national level, all of this sort of civil rights organizations decided we can't work in isolation, we can't be siloed. And we came together and formed different coalitions with a small c to work together to push the strategies and policies that were important and what we decided to do, we, we have a commitment to one another. If you are pushing something at National Low Income Housing Coalition, it may not be sort of a fair housing issue, but I'm gonna support you. And you do the same for me at NAFA. And we've been doing that and it has really, really been effective and helped us to um, um, push back against some very harmful policies, but also, uh, see the fruition of policies and legislation that would help our coalitions. Well, I, I, I already said I think the first thing everybody should do is um, challenge the way this is being mistaught in your local schools, because that's something you can do without a big organization. It's something every individual citizen can do, and it's a place to begin the conversation in your communities about how your communities were segregated. Another thing that uh, I think you can do is when you participate in the analysis of impediments, uh, the analysis of impediments should include the history of your communities and how these segregation, uh, the boundaries of segregation were accomplished. One thing that, for example, you could do 
is, I didn't mention this in my talk, but as, as uh, you probably know, uh, up until really 1953, uh, the US courts, state and local, enforced in an unconstitutional fashion uh, these clauses and deeds that uh, prohibited a sale of homes to African Americans. Well, those clauses still exist. They're still in the deeds. They're no longer enforced, but they're still in the deeds. And that, the existence of those clauses in the, deeds, in the deeds is an enormous opportunity to engage in a community education project about how your communities came to be um, uh, segregated. Personally, uh, I think that can't, you can't eliminate them on an individual basis. You'd have to hire lawyers who charge even more than any lawyers in this room to eliminate the deed, that clause from your deed. But you could advocate for state legislation that either eliminates, the, that requires county recorders of deeds to eliminate them uh, on a wholesale basis. Personally, I think that instead of eliminating them, you should, there should be state legislation that requires uh, county recorders of deeds to substitute language uh, along the lines of we recognize that this uh, deed previously uh, had an unconscionable policy of um, excluding minorities from our community and we're ashamed of it. And we want to assert in our deed that we welcome neighbors of all races and ethnicities to our community. So those kinds of things are <laughs> local actions that can be taken that would contribute to the building of a movement, of a new civil rights movement around the issue of uh, uh, segregated housing. We cannot desegregate simply by learning the history, simply by understanding that we've got a constitutional problem. Past civil rights victories have come about not only because of understanding, understanding was important, but it was also created by civil rights movements, by demonstrations, by marches, by civil disobedience. And we need to re reimagine a new civil rights movement around this most important issue of, how, of, these, of segregated housing. You know, James mentioned how long it's taken for schools to uh, desegregate. But the reason that schools remain so segregated in this society is primarily because they're located in segregated neighborhoods. And unless we desegregate neighborhoods, we're not going to accomplish much in school desegregation. The one thing that, that I think is so incredibly transformative about Richard's book that I think we can replicate on a smaller level, all of us within our work, is recapturing the public narrative. That we have to have a story and be able to tell that story in order to be effective in our advocacy, whether we're talking litigation or we're talking legislation. It all has to tie back to that clear story of wrong and how we want to right that wrong. And so as we think about proceeding and think about building coalitions, none of the work is new in terms of building relationships amongst ourselves. We do that all the time on any number of topics. But when it comes to housing discrimination and desegregation and the connection to wealth generation and the accumulation and transfer of that wealth generation over generation, particularly among people of color, that has to be a story that we tell loudly because it's not a story that's getting the kind of traction that it should. But now I think we have an opening to be able to talk about that over and over and over again and galvanize the kind of movement that Richard's talking about around a narrative that people can really understand that this isn't some passive harm of 50 years gone by. It is a pernicious and pervasive harm that is visited on so many of us today. So once we recapture that narrative and elevate it, then that creates some of the space for the political action, the legal action, the regulatory action, the funding action that will get us to where we need to be. And I'll, uh... Donna, close us out with this statement and then we're gonna turn it over to you all for some questions. So I'm, I'm gonna uh, respond by embellishing on what everyone else has said um, and, and to, to very sincerely say that, um, uh, I'll start with Richard, um, your, your book and your, your previous writings uh, have really influenced me as a, uh, as a professional. Uh, recently I was talking with my kids um, about your book and my kids are in school, uh, you know, K-12, uh, and one of the ideas that we hit upon is, um, you know, if the, the history is not being taught in our schools, uh, can we find ways for our kids to bring that history into the classroom? And so every community practically in America has this terrible history. Uh, and it's still in the, the records of your town or your county or your subdivision or whatnot. And it's there to discover. And so, you know, if, if 
we haven't done it yet, but you know, if our kids went to the historical society in our town uh, and looked up, you know, what what those ordinances were or the um, you know the the deed restrictions and whatnot, um, it would be there, uh, and that's something that. I think we need to embrace and reckon with as a people um, and, and um, bring that into the fore. This is not past history that was solved by a speech. This is current, you know, current affairs. These, these are things that are affecting our lives today. So I, I uh, would love to talk with you about you know, more ideas like that that can energize our young people. Um, on the uh, reclaiming the public narrative, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think as we have um, engaged on this narrative challenge. Um, as I said earlier, we're up against so much. Um, I would love for all of us, you know, we're all communicators here, we're all ambassadors for our work, every single one of us. Uh, if we can think about how we can progress from thinking about affordable housing as charity, which, you know, you heard the secretary say this in a, in a news article recently, it's like the charitable arm of federal government is HUD. Uh, so move away from that. Uh, even the, the current thinking that a lot of us have engaged in is this notion that it is the, the government's responsibility, uh, right? That is certainly true. It is absolutely, absolutely important. Um, I would add to that the notion that public housing, uh, affordable housing, should be regarded as a public good that is good for society. Uh, it's not just beneficial to certain sets of people. It's beneficial to everyone and all kinds of spillover benefits for our nation. If you look at the way other countries have addressed affordable housing and have done so successfully, they're reaping lots and lots of benefits that everyone can enjoy. And so that's something that I think, you know, as we move the progression of the narrative to something that's really proactive uh, and that is part of this uh, progressive vision, I think that's really critical. And just to, to Lisa's point, um, this is the point that I feel most um, strongly in the work that we do as, as folks in the philanthropic sector. Um, you know, we can help to bring people together um, and uh, encourage folks to, to try to work together uh, towards these goals. Uh, one thing that I uh, have been really trying to encourage um, our, our allies and colleagues to do is to, to go beyond your usual circles. Um, we're all housing activists, advocates, experts. Uh, talk to some folks who work on economic justice, uh, people who work on you know, organizing workers. Uh, talk to environmentalists. Uh, Talk to other folks who might have common cause with you, uh, might have a reason to agree uh, to join the fight and to, to not only uh, join the fight for more affordable housing, but you know, to, to push for a broader progressive vision uh, in general. And so you know, that type of bridge building is really critical uh, because otherwise we're going to be siloed in our individual issues and we're not going to gain the type of traction that we really need to gain. Very good. Thank you. So we're going to take a few minutes to open it up for some questions and I see some hands. I'm going to start to my left and I'll start to the very far left with the gentleman on the front row and then we'll work our way across the room. Uh, John Zerker, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Council of Presidents uh, for the Resident Association, uh, local and state chair of housing with the uh, NAACP. Uh, I've, I welcome this panel. I've heard some great things today. It builds some hope for me, but it's, it's got to be more of a broader base. And what I mean by that is, and thank you, uh, Mr. Richard, for everything you said about civil rights and we need a new civil rights. Um, I heard something today in the workshop that we were in with some of the people like me who were at a panel who were sharing the experience, strength, and hope and things that have worked. We've been coming to uh, Capitol Hill with the National Coalition for Low Income House for a long time. In fact, I sat on the board for a term. But what I heard today from people like me, it needs to be more empowered and needs to be uh, uh, exposed to more of this type of conversation so that we can broaden that base for our own national coalition, our own national uh, uh, representation for civil rights, for, for, for the rights to be uh, homeowners and all those things. 50 years ago, I think you mentioned that we, a lot of things that were taken away. We're steadily more going backwards, and I'm not just talking about black folks, I'm talking about poor people. This gentrification thing, Sean Donovan giving all the property over to HUD all over the country. Two weeks ago, they just signed an ownership over to Housing Authority. And we got land where only a small portion of it is, well, we're going to be over in the corner with this market value, renters and all this thing. I can go on and on, but I said, 
But I, for everybody here is that we have to be more empowered as people who've been coming to here for a long time, get information, then we, we disintegrate once we get back to where we're at. We need to make it happen the day before we leave here uh, to empower ourselves to start the caucus, start the coalition, so that we can start being more empowered as a collective. Thank you. Thank you. Question front row, right next to the uh, monitor, and then we'll come across to Barbara and work our way across. Hi, um, I'm Karen Hill, and I'm one of the founding members of the coalition, and I succeeded Cushing Gobert as chair. I think it's terribly important for this audience to know that there's a reason why we're selling, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, because it wasn't passed when the other civil rights legislation was passed in 64. And there were memos written that said, costs too much, serves too few, has no political constituency. And unfortunately, we are still in the same situation. Now let me say, as a coalition, because I think we're all in the same tent, it was hard to get a fair housing conversation going within this coalition. I'm here to tell you, people did not want to address the vestiges of discrimination. And I'm, so I'm glad that we're seeing this as an opening panel, but there is more work for us to do. We need to have every member of the building trades industry as a part of this coalition, because we have to learn how to follow the money. The money at HUD that we fight for is minuscule as compared to the money that HUD provides for these, for, um, for these market rate developers to do what they do. Okay, now I'm, I'm not a part of the coalition like I used to be, but we need to go back to knowing from whence we came in order to go forward in a way that we are impacting the dollars that go out from our federal government so that we are part of the conversation. And as it relates to uh, breaking down these patterns of discrimination. I was the federal court's housing implementation officer for the city of Yonkers. Okay, so I've seen this up close, in person, in a historical way that you cannot even begin to imagine. Okay, but I'm here to say that even if we broke down all of the patterns, we would still only have 10% of whites and 10% of blacks that would choose on a voluntary basis to go into these non-traditional neighborhoods. So know that, know the cards that you're working with. Know who your partners ought to be and figure out how to broaden the tent and engage those people. That's all. Thank you. Right on across on the front row. Right on across here on the front row. Like on the top. Um, Barbara Burnham from Season Partners in Silver Spring. Um, this was a fabulous, fabulous panel. Um, and what you're, what you're giving us, and Donna, you, as you know, I went through that process and it was an excruciatingly difficult process, but it opened up the conversation that still exists now. What I would suggest is that, Richard, you need a publicist. You need a publicist and you need a podcast. NAACP, although you do fabulous stuff, there's lots of housing work to do on the ground. And with, with, the fair, with the Fair Housing Group, you have enormous impact on a lot of us who've been in housing for so many years. But as Diane said in her, in her, in her speech, we're starting a campaign. That campaign needs money. Dawn, I'm leaving you out of this because you're sitting there with some of the money, but we can trust you. We know that. We know that. There's other folks here. But, but this band should stay together. And the band should be, the band should be expanded so that, so that there is a campaign. I can, I can tell, I can tell you, because I'm still up on the hill, I can tell you that maybe, maybe three staff people up there that I know know anything at all about, about fair housing. Anything. They're, many of them are 30, 35 year olds, they're my kids' age. So we need, Richard, we need a podcast we can put in front of them for 10 minutes. 
and get out what you got out in the 15 minutes you talked about. Because it will spur, and I'll give them the Howard Zinn books for sure, <laughs> but um, that that's what we need. We need the tools that will work and that will give folks out in the communities tools that will work with, the, with their local realtors, with their local home builders, with their local city councils. Thank you, Barbara. We're going to just take two quick questions. We need to make it real quick. We're short on time. And um, let's come up here to the front. It's the third row. And then we'll take one over on this side. Sorry, we're just running a little short on time now. Thank you all for being here. Excellent panel. Thank you for sharing. Richard, I just purchased the book and I'm already in love with it. Thank you so much. Uh, in your book, you talked about the 13th Amendment in comparison to fair housing. Um, if you think we would have took more action back then with the 13th Amendment, we would be in a different place today. And also, the second part of my question, for the Fair Housing Act, which has seven protected classes, um, would it be right for us to add income as a protected class? Because a lot of people are being discriminated against, against affordability. Well, all right, I'll begin with the 13th Amendment. Um, it's ludicrous to think that when um, we fought the Civil War and passed the 13th Amendment that emancipated slaves, that we intended to simply convert slaves from legal property to sharecroppers. That was not the intent of the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment had a section two which required Congress to implement legislation to implement the 13th Amendment, to create African Americans a first class citizenship, not a second class or a third class or a fourth class citizenship. Congress in 1866 passed a Civil Rights Act that was designed to provide first class citizenship for African Americans. It, for example, prohibited discrimination in housing. The Supreme Court, in its reactionary period, um, prohibited the enforcement of that Civil Rights Act. A hundred years later, we finally, 102 years later, we finally passed the Civil Rights Act with no enforcement provisions. We still hadn't caught up with what the 1866 Act anticipated was going to happen. So you're right, the 13th Amendment has never been implemented. And when we think about what its intent was, it was certainly not to create, to change slaves into second class citizens. Its intent was to abolish a class of citizenship, to abolish a caste society, and we've never implemented it. Thank you. Adding income as, so we have worked with Congress for a number of years to actually add source of income as a protected class under the Federal Fair Housing Act, along with veteran status and LGBTQ status. Um, so those of you who are going to make your Hill visits, we would appreciate a shout out in support of that. It's called the HOME Act. Um, and we're working with Senators Tim Kaine and uh, Cory Booker, and hopefully, hopefully Tim Scott, to have it reintroduced under the Senate uh, in this session. And, and you should know that there are a number of states that have source of income as a protected class. It is not a requirement for the states to have it. The states have done it of their own volition. Connecticut, um, I think, uh, Maryland, the District of Columbia, California. Okay. This will be our final question from the audience. And if we could go over to this right side of the room. And how uh, about Harold here on the front row? Hi, I'm Harold Simon from Shelter Force, and uh, I have a question about this moment, but I also wanted to say that in a few months we'll be starting a podcast. I'd like to invite all of you on this wonderful panel to be guests, uh, more about that. But, so I, I want to ask this with, with all due respect, because sometimes we, uh, we, we, come back to things that we try to do and then try them again because they're really good ideas. And so changing the narrative is not a phrase that I've just heard today. 
and building coalitions is the most important thing we can do, but hardly the newest thing to do. So what about this moment in time that is going to either push us to success or make it possible for that to happen? I think on, on that point, virtually everybody's in agreement that the world is on fire right now. And as a result of that, the coalitions that we are building are stronger and quicker and more broad-based than they have been in quite some time. So this is, a, in my view, a case of never let a good crisis go to waste while we have the attention of the world and while people are focused on the fact that good public policy is needed to solve some of our bigger challenges, we seize that opportunity and try our best to do those things that we know we've done before with varying levels of success. I don't, I'm not a firm believer that we have to do something in particular that is different. If we've tried it before and just failed at it, it may be the right thing to do. We may not have had the right conditions. We may not have had the right folks at the table. But from what I see across generations and across disciplines, we have a new set of coalitions and a new set of understandings that we need to do this work now and we need to do it better than we've done it before in order to achieve our objectives. So I, I think the conditions are different than they have been that would lead us to believe we have a window of opportunity and should take it. With that, um, okay. Harold, okay. Yeah, shout okay. out to that, Harold. Um, and thanks for the question. It's, it's a really important one um, because uh, I, I agree with James, I think, um, the world is on fire. Um, you know, the, the weird thing about this moment in history is that um, so many people are, are recognizing that we can't take certain things for granted anymore. Uh, how, how many of us would have predicted that we would be, you know, passionately talking about the freedom of the press, and how important that is, uh, or, or just basic, you know, voting systems, voting, I mean, these are things that uh, have become incredibly obvious to us, you know, things that previously might have been fairly abstract for some people, um, but are incredible, have always been incredibly challenging for a lot of folks, uh, including uh, the folks that, that we work on behalf of. Um, and it's become even more um, stark today. And so uh, I think this is a unique moment in that regard. Um, well, maybe not unique, but it certainly feels weird uh, in a particular way. Um, and it is a, a rallying point, I think, for all of us to uh, to come up with new uh, ways to work together. Um, I would say prior to you know, this last couple of years, um, I've never been in a funder collaborative uh, of all the national funders that care about housing uh, and meeting regularly, doing things together, coordinating, trying to figure out like, how we can you know, have the most influence uh, within the sector to try to bring more funders into the sector, either on issues of displacement, gentrification, or issues of just like straight up you know, housing affordability. I mean, to me, that's a really new thing. It's really promising. Um, to your, your point, ma'am, uh, from Yonkers, um, and, and to you know, Lisa's uh, work and uh, the, the fair housing community, you know, having that community be very welcome uh, in this coalition is really critical. It feels, uh, you know, um, maybe it's not entirely new, but it's really, it's, it's not typical. Um, and so I, I see promising signs uh, of that type of um, collaboration, and I hope that that's the beginning of what we can do together. Thank you. Let's thank our panelists. <laughs>